The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to the webinar. The title of today's webinar is APS Study on the Impact of COVID-19, and I will introduce our speakers shortly. Uh, next slide. A quick dis uh, disclaimer before we get started, the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Research Center, or the APS TARC, as we call it, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view don't necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Uh, next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC. We are here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Uh, contact info will be displayed at the end of the webinar. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on the use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative programs and strategies. Next slide. Please consider joining our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three calls per month. There's one for investigators, one for supervisors, and one for administrators. Uh, the schedule for these calls is on your screen, and you can also check out our website or email us if you would like more information. If you go to the website, you just go to the uh, uh, peer support link and check it out. Uh, next slide. We also have a page on our site dedicated to COVID-19 and APS. There's a link to this page and a red box at the top of our site. On this page, you'll find resource information and a summary of state program responses to the pandemic. And you'll also find a copy of the report that we're going to discuss today on that page. So and we'll repeat that link at the end of the webinar. Uh, next slide. A bit of housekeeping before we get started. Today's slides and a copy of the report that we're discussing uh, being presented are available to download now in the handouts section of your GoToWebinar control panel. You can just click on the titles to download those. All participants are muted for this webinar and you must use your computer to access audio. If you have any problems with audio, we suggest exiting the webinar and then re-entering it. So please adjust the volume of your computer speakers as well to the desired level in case things are a little too quiet for you. Next slide. If you have questions of our presenters, simply type them in the questions box at any time. We'll pause for questions towards the end and we'll get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. This session is being recorded. It will be posted to the web at a later date. We'll notify everyone via email, um, all the people that registered for this webinar when uh, it's posted online. And you'll receive uh, an automatically generated message within 24 hours of closing the webinar and it includes a certificate of attendance. Uh, sorry though, CEUs are not offered for this event. Next slide. Now we'll take a quick poll to get the feel of our audience and who is in attendance. I'm going to launch that poll now. If you've never done a poll before, basically you just click on your screen and respond to this question. Which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Um, do you feel like you're primarily an adult protective services professional, um, some other social services professional, a medical professional, legal professional? or other if none of those categories fit at all. And again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you're in full screen mode, you may need to hit your escape key um, to minimize the window a bit in order to make your selections. I'm gonna leave that open just for a few more seconds, giving everybody a chance to vote. Maybe about five more seconds, then we'll close it out and share the results with everybody. So I'm going to close that poll out now and share the results. So it looks like 61% of you are APS professionals, 19% other social services professional, 1% medical, 4% legal, and then 15% of you um, are, have categorized yourself as other. So um, you don't fit into any of those categories specifically. Um, next slide, please. So I would like to introduce our today's speakers. Um, Dr. Pamela Teaster is professor and the director of Center for Gerontology at Virginia Tech. 
She's worked on many different studies that involve adult protective, adult protective services, and she's extremely knowledgeable. She is actually um, one of the authors of the report that we're going to be talking about today, and she's one of my favorite speakers, actually, personally. Um, and then Carl Urban is a senior research manager with the APS TARC and WRMA and was one of the subject matter experts who worked on this report that we're discussing today. Carl's knowledge of APS is massive, uh, and I'm lucky to call him one of my coworkers. So at this point, I will now turn things over to Pam and Carl. And it looks like we may have our speakers muted. So you may need to hit the unmute button. There no, you go. that was my fault. Uh, that was my fault. Um, so next slide, please. Um, uh, and, and I was primarily muted because of the dog in the background that you may now be hearing. Uh, this study has an interesting history. Um, we started off last year doing a study for the Administration for Community Living on opioids, and then the pandemic hit, and we quickly determined that it was um, not a good year to be studying the impact of opioids on APS because nothing in APS was normal. Uh, so we quickly converted um, to trying to do a point-in-time study about the impact of, of COVID. Um, and we'll talk about some of the strengths and some of the limitations of that um, as we go through it in just a second. Uh, and as it says at the bottom, this year we're back to our study on opioids. Next slide, please. So today, what we want to do is, is we want to kind of give you um, what we've learned from the study on opioids, uh, uh, opioids, on COVID, or copioids, as I sometimes call it. Um, we want to we want to enlighten you as to what we found out about the impact that COVID nineteen had on APS programs, how the APS programs responded to that, and then try to tease out if we can any lessons learned uh, so that APS programs, as they respond, including now in our new way or in the future, how they can respond better to things like a pandemic or any other types of emergency disasters. So we're gonna give you the background on the study, the methods, the limitations, the findings, the discussion, kind of the classic research um, presentation on a study. So next slide, please. Uh, so how is this going to work? Uh, we got one hour and we have got five categories of findings to go through. Um, and we wanna give you guys some times to talk at the end. So we're going to go fast. Uh, basically, we're going, to, we're going to do a little poll at the start of each section to see kind of where our audience is right now in relationship to the study question. Um, and then we're going to go through the findings from our study and hopefully we can have time, as I said, at the end for discussion of the whole thing. So um, the purpose of the study on the next slide um, was to just take a look at how did APS programs respond to all of the changes that COVID-19 brought to them and what impact did those changes have on the programs. Uh, and it wasn't really more complicated than that. We tried to look at, at five different questions, um, as you'll see on the next slide. Um, and and I did this alliteration is kind of a framework that we often use to do program evaluations in APS. So we tried to look at the impact of performance on policy and practice, on personnel, partnerships, and preparedness. And we'll give you, as we go through this, a definition of what each of these areas mean. And with that, I'm gonna let Pam tell you about methods since she was the primary researcher. Well, thank you, Carl. And I'm glad, I'm very glad to get to, to be on this presentation with you all fun and high energy. And Andy, thank you for the introduction. Um, so we actually used a three-step sort of funnel process to try to get to the information that we were trying to understand related to um, how COVID-19 was affecting operations for APS. So first, those kindly ones of you who did this, we did telephone interviews with eight state-level APS administrators 
for the then hot spots at the time of the interview, because all of you know that has shifted around since we have been at this front of at the front of the pandemic. Do you remember March? Wasn't that two years ago? Um, the findings from the interviews we then used to inform the questions for the next phases. And so in phase two, then we did a national survey of state APS programs and um, we even beta tested that prior to sending that out to see what people thought of that. Also, the eight left, the eight state administrators also looked at it. At that point, we had at the end of the survey, for those of you that took it, we also asked if we might have some suggestions for individual and small group interviews. So we sort of got the state level and we got some information on the local level. And that <laughs> in particular is something that we really wanted to try to find. So we really tried to drill down to get both a, both a state picture and the local one as well. Thank you, and next slide, please. There were, as any study has, limitations. The national study assumed that all APS programs follow state mandates, policies, and procedures, but we know that there was frustration from some of the county administered um, states um, that the answer to the survey didn't reflect some of the counties in their state, couldn't, couldn't do all those. Also, due to constraints in the study timeline, um, we were not able to interview as many people as we had hoped to. We were simply butting up against the end. By the time we switched, as Carl said, from a study on, COVID, on, on opioids to a study on COVID, we were off and running. And we do use the word COVID, copioids, but I'm not sure that's really a good idea since we seem to confuse that a lot. Um, so a very fluid timeline. And then in instances where the state provided recommended COVID-19 modifications, there were no mechanisms for us to determine the extent to which counties implemented them. Thank you. Next slide. So what were the big takeaways? Our study reinforced that APS programs have a unique role and provide unique, unique resources into the, to communities around the United States. And yet, um, we and, and that, that COVID clearly affected how APS does business. Also, there were clear struggles for programs how to respond to an unplanned emergency, um, how to protect workers and where to get PPE, because this was a huge and frightening issue, remember March? Um, how to conduct assessments and collect evidence um, without face-to-face -face visits, a hallmark of what APS does. Um, how to support community partners who, need front, who needed frontline resources and how to work remotely, particularly for those who didn't have equipment or processes in place to support the doing of that. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna switch to talking about our findings in each of the five areas that, are, that reinforce those kind of those big takeaways. And the first area that we wanna talk about is performance. And, and when I, talk about performance, I'm thinking about performance management. What are all of the metrics that you look at? In reality, for, for um, COVID, I almost said copioids, for COVID, um, about the only thing we really could get a, a good handle on was workload. And so we tried to determine the short-term impact on program work and workload, uh, in particular by looking at the impact on the number of cases and the types of cases and, and some of the workload issues that staff had to deal with. So next slide is a poll. Um, and so, you know, as Pam said, this was, this was done, our study was done at a point in time. So we're now curious about what's been the long-term effect of COVID-19 on your workload. And I suppose this is just a survey poll for the APS staff to answer. So I have launched that poll now and people can vote um, by clicking on their screen. And the question is, what has been the long-term effect of COVID-19 on your workload? Is there no impact, slight decrease, significant decrease, slight increase or significant increase? We'll leave this open just for a little bit for um, folks to vote. And again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. If you're in full screen mode, you may have to exit that in order to vote. I think I'll leave it open for about another 10 seconds, and then we'll close it out and share the results. I'm gonna close it out. 
right now and share the results of that poll with everybody. So it looks like the majority of folks had slight decrease. At, I'm sorry, the majority of folks had a slight increase at 41%. Um, the least was a significant decrease at 4%. And I'll hide those so we can go back to our slides. And so going back to our fluid situation point in time, as we go to the next slide, the poll results are not consistent with what we found um, because the poll was asking you and I assume you answered based on your long-term experience. And so as we were going through the period of the study in, hmm, I guess, June, was when we did the survey. Pam can correct me if I'm wrong about that in a second. Um, what we found out was that when everything shut down, as Pam keeps saying, remember back in the spring, when everything shut down, what APS actually experienced was a decrease um, in reports. And you can see the numbers here on that. Most APS program, and these percentages are the percent of states that reported something. Um, most states reported that they had, at least initially, a decrease in reports. Um, but that decrease in reports was coupled with probably some increase in client need, uh, as you can see in the middle box there. Um, and, and so you've got less reports, um, increased client need, and at the same time, you've got increased difficulty in engaging clients. Um, Decreasing workload, increasing need, and more difficulty in, increase in engaging clients. Next slide, please. And so, um, what's an APS program to do? I mean, how do they respond to that? Uh, and so, we wanted to know, given these external factors that were affecting their ability to do their work, what impact did it actually have? And so 80% of the states indicated that there was no change in their level of client involvement in planning and decision making. So while they were having trouble engaging them on the front end, they were figuring out on the back end as they were getting to the planning and decision making stage, methods and ways to try to engage um, those clients. Um, as to how much services they were receiving, there was really a very mixed response. About half of the states indicated that there was less investigation of states, um, and 30% indicated that there was no change um, in that. Uh, and when it came to providing services, about half the states indicated they were providing fewer services to states, and 24% reported that there was no change. Uh, and a few states actually reported there were even more services. Um, so what is the impact overall in that short-term window on workload? Uh, based on all of this, I guess it's a bit of a wash. Uh, uh, and, and it's interesting to, to think about and to look at your poll results from a second ago. And those are not inconsistent, if I remember correctly, from when we did this workshop at the NAPSA conference. In the long term, and I think this is something we've heard anecdotally, in the long term, it seems to have increased workload a little bit. Um, uh, we, we have collected 2020, or we will be collecting 2020 namers data here over the next couple of months. And uh, we started thinking about how do we, how do we look at 2020 compared to 2019 and, and assess what changes there are on the assumption that a lot of those changes are going to be driven by COVID. And so we hope to do some more analysis of these types of workload issues. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing that we looked at was the impact on the number and types of maltreatment reports. And so most respondents indicated that there was no change in the types of adult maltreatment their clients were experiencing. Um, a third of the APS programs saw a small increase in the cases of self-neglect, um, and 23% saw a large increase in the cases of self-neglect. And given the shutdown status, the lack of the increased social isolation and the lack of connection within the community, that is not surprising. Um, 
but it will be interesting to take a look, as I said, at the 2020 data compared to the 2019 data, because this was the perception of the programs at the time. So it will be interesting to look at the data and see how things actually came out. So next slide, please, and I will turn it over to Pam. Thank you, Carl. So now I'm gonna look at the personnel section. Uh, and talk about what we what we look there with the P's that Carl was talking about in alliteration. Um, and so here we wanted to look at the impact on staff in areas such as job satisfaction, readiness, safety, et cetera, and try to try to figure out how to reduce negative impacts during future emergencies because there will be more. Um, so, but hopefully not today. So, um, if, next slide, please. So this is going to be one of those times that that you are going to do another poll and Andy, the wonderful Andy, is going to do that because I would have absolutely no idea how to make that work. <laughs> I've launched that having for done, you. I've launched having done this in class when I used to teach uh, you know, large sections of class, um, their, their wonderful Andy has put up the, question, the quick poll and if you will put what the effect of COVID-19 has been on your staff now. Remember, I think it's really important what Carl said about the work we did was at a point in time. So we'll leave that open for just a little bit and give people a chance to think about it and vote. And again, what has been the effect of COVID-19 on staff, e.g. job satisfaction, job readiness, and safety? Has there been no impact, a slight impact, or a significant impact? So we'll leave that open for probably another mm, 10 seconds, giving folks a chance to think about it a little bit and vote. I'm going to close that out here in just a few seconds, and I'll share the results right now. It looks like 61% said significant impact, 38% slight, and only 1% said there was no impact at all. Pam. So that's pretty. That's pretty significant um, to 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 say that there has been some impact, and in particular, over half are a significant impact. Thank you very much, Andy. Sure. So next and, slide. And and I would, and, every, and if you go back one, uh, back one slide, um, don't want to miss, put some of the notable impacts in the chat box for us. Um, that will be helpful. We'll try to look through those as we're going and have some discussion at the end. Sorry, Pam. Okay, absolutely. Fine. Um, okay, now to the next slide. All right, so we wanted to look at the overall impact of remote work. What has that been like for individuals? And so um, one of the things that we found that was pretty important was that, that almost three fourths of the people who responded said staff had received adequate support from management. Um, over half had said that workers had tech support that they needed. Um, and then nearly half said workers had to training support that they needed. But farther down were more confounding results. For example, worker morale declined at about the same way worker morale improved. And then there were people who didn't have enough tech support or training support or efficiency decrease. So there were lots of potential stressors for staff. Almost all programs went to remote work at some point. A number of states reported taking on additional roles and responsibilities. So that created more stress. What were those roles? They included additional services to clients like health screenings. That was about 40 percent. Assisting other organizations such as food banks and shelters, and that was nearly uh, that was nearly three fourths. And as well as the popular other, such as helping with cases of repatriation, provision of emergency information as a call center, enhanced communication with hospitals. In, uh, initial screenings of individuals who had positive test results. Only a small percentage of states reported a decrease in support from management. Of course, management completed the survey. Next slide, please. Supports provided to APS workers as a result of COVID-19. Um, so overwhelmingly um, ac provided access to PPE, and that was almost 100% as well as increased communications and check-ins with supervisors, which, which have got to be a lot more, so more than three-fourths of programs, as well as increased opportunities for peer discussion and mental health services provided. So um, most provided were provided with personnel uh, PPE, but this was contrary to the beginning of the pandemic when it wasn't adequate, even cleaning supplies not adequate. So most APS staff had check-ins, um, more discussion and access to mental health services. Next slide, please. 
work, worker safety was another really important component of something we wanted to learn about because of course, remember again, back our early parts of the pandemic, we didn't, we really even had no idea how this thing was transmitted. I can remember, I am sure those of you who actually went out to get groceries, um, that in the beginning, you know, was to find Clorox wipes so you could wipe down every single thing you had and leave your groceries in your, in your garage or your car for three days. Remember we sort of did those sorts of things. So as, as, as uh, Carl will reveal and, and me too, um, there are, this is a point in time where we were getting information and that is evolving. And clearly things are evolving in the past two weeks as we know and happily so for that in some ways. So, um, so as far as worker safety, 89% of states reported that staff were concerned with being infected during face-to-face -face investigations. 80% of states reported that staff were concerned with infecting clients, so that's just about equal. Over half of states reported that staff were concerned with not having enough PPE. Again, early on, this may have changed, and over half of states reported that staff were concerned with infecting other staff members. Carl, back to you. So the next area that we want to talk about is policy and practice. And so what impact did COVID have on those rules or those practices that drive how you conduct your investigations and how you interact um, with your clients? Uh, and how did the APS staff respond to these changes in policy and practice? So, Next slide is our poll on this topic. And so we wanna know what has been the long-term effect of COVID-19 on your policy and practice. Uh, has there been a significant impact, a slight impact or no impact? And we'll tell you about the impact um, during the time of the study and after the poll. Thank you, Carl. And again, this question is about the long-term effect on policy and practice. And just like Carl said, either no impact, slight impact, or significant impact. And you can vote by clicking right on your screen. We'll leave this open for just a few more seconds, probably about 15 more seconds to give folks a chance to vote. Like and so have... I would oh, go ahead, Carl. Encourage folks to, um, like on the last poll, if you have some good examples of this, please um, include them in the chat box for us. All right, and I think we're going to close that out in just a few seconds. So I'm going to close that out now and share the results. Looks like 3% said no impact, 48% said slight impact, and then 49% said significant impact. So pretty close split between slight and significant. Pretty close split between slight and significant and pretty clear that it had an impact with only 3% of you indicating that there was no impact. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, so when, when we started talking to APS programs um, early on in this research, or even early on as part of our technical assistance work that we were doing with the APS TARP, um, it, it became pretty clear in a hurry that there were kind of two big, two big, policy changes that APS programs um, were having to make. And that was in that crucial area of making face-to-face -face visits. And then in the second area was in the timeframes that it took to do various aspects of the investigation. Um, uh, and so as, as the slide here says, almost all of the states changed their policy uh, regarding face-to-face. -face. Um, and and, and the statistic on the page doesn't kind of give you the nuance of, of really what they had to do. In many, it wasn't really an all or none decision. Yes, we're doing face-to-face -face visits. No, we're not doing face-to-face -face visits. Um, generally, it was, a, it was a conditional kind of thing, uh, depending upon whatever the state's particular policy or approach to that was. Um, sometimes it depended upon the priority of the case. Sometimes it depended upon the screening information collected, um, and it varied from state to state to state. I still have copies of some of the state policies um, here on my computer that we collected at the time. Um, and the decision wasn't always a very straightforward decision either. 
usually it required uh, caseworker consultation uh, with their supervisors, uh, and it may have been dictated by the tap, type of maltreatment or the degree of risk that had been identified. Next slide, please. Um, so this this details some of the some of the particular policy changes for in-person visits with clients and other persons. Um, and so you see that in in most states, as I said a second ago, a face-to-face -face visit uh, could be made based on a consultation with a supervisor. Uh, in 38 percent of the states, they, they were continuing to make face-to-face -face visits for certain types of maltreatment. Uh, so you, you're more at risk types of maltreatment, particularly physical abuse and sexual abuse. They were more likely to do a face to face visit. Uh, some states had something called significant risk, and that could be defined in the policy at the time that was promulgated. But for those 57 percent of the states, they would continue the face to face visits. 13 percent of the states responded. We are just not doing face to face visits. And then 11% uh, of the states said that there was no change um, in policy, and then 13% were at other. Uh, a curious thing to us from an APS TARC perspective is to kind of know where this is today, which we don't really know. But back in the summer, in the height of the pandemic, um, this is where the APS programs were. So next slide. The other big area, uh, was adjusted to timeline requirements. In an APS case, there's typically kind of two, two timeline requirements that you usually find in policy. One is how long does it take you to initiate the case? And the second is how long does it take you to complete um, the investigation? Uh, for case initiation, 87% uh, of um, the, the state said that there was no change in their policy regarding the time frame for making the case initiation. Now, they may have had a change in the policy regarding the face to face visit, but that still had to be done within the same time frames. A few of the states um, increased the amount of time, and an even smaller few actually got rid of the time requirement. No. For completion of the investigation, almost the same levels. Um, they, they, they did not change policy on completion of the investigation, although we did hear examples of states having a policy change that said, until you can lay eyes on a client, we are not going to be closing cases, but that was by far the minority in the cases, uh, in the states that we heard from. So I will let Pam now talk about partnerships. So another one of the things we wanted to know about, thank you, Carl, was how did relationships change? What was better, worse, what got forged? Because these can, of course, present um, wonderful new opportunities in the midst of a very difficult situation. Next slide, please. So Andy, is going to have another one of those polls. And on this particular one, he'll take the reins again and ask you, what has been the effect of COVID-19 on your community partnerships? What has been the effect of COVID-19 on your community partnerships? No impact, slight impact, or significant impact. Thank you, Pam. And we've got that up right now. Again, just vote by clicking directly on your screen. We'll leave that up for a little bit, give folks a chance to think about it. Again, this is about community partnerships and the effect of COVID-19 on them. Leave it open for another 15 seconds or so. Looks like about half of our folks have voted. So we'll give it just a little bit longer. So I'm gonna close that out here in just a second. So get your votes in. All right, now share the results with everybody. It looks like 54% said it was a slight impact, 34% said it was a significant impact, and only 13% said no impact at all. Okay. All right, so next slide. All right, so when we look at interaction with critical APS partners, 
um, and referral services because of COVID, we see a few things of, the, of interest. More than half of states re reported no change in their interactions with mental health services, that'd be about 60%, food banks, almost 60, and other services, that would be about three-fourths because of COVID. At least one-third of states reported increases in interactions because of COVID with healthcare, that would be close to 50%, law enforcement, about the same, about 40%, and food banks, about 40%. Less than one fourth of states reported less interactions with critical APS partners and referral services because of COVID. That would include law enforcement, uh, about 20%, healthcare, uh, slightly over 10, same for mental health services, much lower for food bank referrals and other types of referrals. Okay, next slide and back to Carl. So the kind of the last area that we wanted to look at um, was preparedness plans. Um, and I remember being on a phone call with a number of APS administrators very early in this, listening to them talk about their continuous operations plans that they may have had in their agency. And so what we wanted to try to figure out was, okay, how well were the, had the agencies prepared for a pandemic particularly. Um, and, and then out of that preparedness, um, did that end up meaning that they were gonna have staff and client needs that were left unaddressed as a consequence of that? Um, and so um, that's what we tried to take a look at. And so next slide and our, I think our last poll is, was your agency or program prepared for a pandemic? Uh, it caught us by surprise. We had some plans and supports in place. And if you go back for just a second, I guess you can't. We had some plans and supports in place, or we had plans and supports in place that allowed us to quickly adjust. So not prepared, somewhat prepared, or significantly prepared. And you can vote by clicking on your screen. We'll leave this open for a while and give folks a chance to think about it and let us know what they thought. Looks like we've got about a quarter of the attendees voted so far. Again, this is just your opinion about your agency or program's preparedness for the pandemic. All right, we'll leave it open for just a few more seconds because we've got about half the folks who voted. So I'm going to close that out now and share the results. It looks like 52% said somewhat prepared, 40% uh, said not prepared at all, and 9% said significantly prepared. And, and so that, that seems um, pretty consistent. Next slide, please. Um, with with what we found out um we don't have a lot of statistics to throw at you here but we did find out that about two-thirds of the states um had some sort of preparedness plans in place um but the reality of those plans is indicated by the quote um, from one of our interviews on the right, which said most of our preparedness was geared for hurricanes, tropical storms, natural disasters. But as a program, we didn't have a plan for a pandemic. Um, now at the state level, I know there's a state level pandemic plan that is in place. So while they may have had some sort of continuous operations plans, nobody had contemplated uh, a complete shutdown and the need to stop doing face-to-face -face visits and the need to start re working remotely, which was a huge change for APS staff. Uh, I mean, that was one of the first things that we as an APS um, TARC had to react to to try to provide supports to states because all of a sudden states were having to uh scramble to get the technology in the hands of their workers and the management processes in place to support this concept of remote work which they may have read about somewhere 
but suddenly became a reality for them. And then there were so many other aspects of, of preparedness planning um, that they had to scramble to figure out how to do, um, but with their current experience should do a better job of in the future. Nonetheless, um, they weren't entirely prepared for the impact that it was gonna have on staff and on clients. And I'll let Pam tell you a little bit about that. Thank you, Carl. So now for the next two slides, this one will be current needs for staff. Um, the states don't have, an, have at all, or um, the states do not have at all or enough of, and then the next one will be for clients. So um, I, I think this is really reflective of people who are working uh, for APS, but the first biggest need uh, at 60% was childcare. Um, and I am sure any of you with um, young children or taking care of young children, grandparents raising grandchildren or whoever you are can understand that one very well. So 60% for the greatest need for their staff was childcare. Work-related staff needs also included PPE, about half, internet capability, um, about 30%, and technology support, about 20%. At least one fourth of states indicated that staff needed emergency funds for their own financial problems, care for dependent adults, and mental health services about 30%. 26% of states reported that staff needed emergency shelter and 14% indicated their staff needed food banks. Next slide, please. Current needs for clients. Um, not surprising that that the big the big 60 percenters were technology support, relatedly internet capability, and relatedly emergency funds for financial problems. But close behind were needs for emergency shelters, mental health services, PPE, and care for dependent adults. And then more along the 20% line or below food bank services, childcare, other and no needs reported. But I think those early significant ones for technology and internet capability are quite linked. Um, emergency funds for financial problems and shelter group together as well as mental health services and so forth. Next slide, please. This is an easier, hard one. Um, questions. I'm going to let Carl finish off and then we can move to um, perhaps what you have to say while you're typing in the box carl can go to the last slide on the final word no well let's let's pause here um okay and, and so this is where uh we want to pause and see what we may have gone through too fast or not deep enough that you may have questions about or where you can relate to us how you're experience was similar or to dissimilar what to what we described um, earlier in the webinar. Um, and in particular, we would be interested in any lessons learned out of this for those APS staff or even for those community partner staff that work with APS. What did you learn out of this, this unusual circumstances that we had to go through uh, that you're going to carry forward and improve your APS program or that you're implementing right now <clears throat> through this current wave um, with COVID. So questions for us, your lessons learned or your experience that's a little bit different than what we related. Andy, I guess we're only using the chat box, correct? Yeah, and there was a little confusion earlier about the chat box, just so everyone knows. When you type in the chat box, it goes directly to us, and we're going to relay some of those concerns. But even if we don't get to relay some of those concerns, we'd still like to hear from you because we do retain this information, and we can look at it later on. So feel free to type um, you know, whatever input you have about what we've gone over today. I think first what I'll do is summarize a little bit about some of the um, thoughts people had about the poll questions um, as we went through the presentation, um, people shared a pretty wide variety of issues they were having because of the pandemic. One person noted an increase in stress, um, actually lost positions and had inadequate coverage. Um, obviously, some people said staff were stressed out on how to accomplish their work. It was very difficult to complete investigations or is difficult to complete investigations. 
it's difficult to, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this, decide what incidents rise to the level of going out to see a client in person um, and which should be dealt with over the phone. Um, and then also the increase in work stress was hard to balance with their family life. Um, some people said they felt like they were just unable to do their jobs and unable to do their assessments and make sure that the clients were safe um, because they weren't seeing the clients in person. Um, and they were having difficulty linking clients with resources because some of those resources were no longer available um, because of the pandemic. Um, one person noted uh, uh, there was no change in mileage. They started to work from their home and had to drive much further. Uh, and the state didn't adjust the mileage policy accordingly with that. Um, several comments about not being able to complete face-to-face uh, -face visits and how difficult that was. One person mentioned community partnerships when um, we asked the poll question about that. Um, their, uh, some of their community partners were closed. They were not able to access them at all. And they had a lack of home care providers available, a lack of law enforcement available, and difficulty in reaching clients by phone. Um, what else? And then we have a series of questions too. So if you're ready, I'll go ahead and get to some of the questions that we had. Maybe we'll come back to some of the comments. Um, one question for both of you, how confident do you feel about the conclusions made since the sample size of the response was small? And again, I'll repeat that. How confident do you feel about the conclusions made in the report since the sample size of the response was small? Is, so I have a question. Is that having to do with the state responses or does that have to do with the local responses? It's a good question. If the person who asked that would like to elaborate a little bit um, in the chat box, we can get, get them to elaborate a little bit. While that's happening, we'll move on to the next question. What impact has APS encountered with courts shutting down, going online, et cetera? Again, what impact has APS encountered with courts shutting down and going online? If there's anything you can say about that. Pam, do you recall anything from the local interviews on that particular question? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I, I, that one, I don't. Um, some of the courts, of course, have gone remote, and that has actually increased some of the accessibility for clients um, when they couldn't get to court. So it's going to sort of double edged sword, but I don't know that I found it from this survey, but from other judges I've spoke uh, judges I've spoken to on other projects. Yeah, and I, I, I do. I don't know. And I know it's had an impact, but I, I wouldn't want to speak without further without doing a little research on it. Sure. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily a part of what we looked at. It sounds like. Um, let's see. What was the number of states that were involved in the survey? Um, I'm going to look that up right now and I can tell you, let me, but I'll have to go look at my report. So if we took another question, I'll go look it up. Sure. Yeah. Um, another question, are there any plans to link these data from APS data systems in certain states? Um, again, so, again, I'm not exactly sure what the, the question is asking. Um, uh, you know, this data came from from our research, and so it doesn't come from any any state data system. Uh, we we do we we have been let me put it this way: we have been talking about how we would go about looking at state APS data to try to particularly on the performance side of this, the workload side of this, um, figure out what the impact of COVID was. Uh, we are just starting that discussion internally and it's just starting to try to try to think about uh, you know what types of data from 2019 we would compare to 2020 and what assumptions that we would make about it. There was one comment from somebody else that said the, the term long-term impact can be difficult wording as we really don't know yet we are still in it. Um, 
<laughs> that is so true. And it is very true, I think. Yes. Yeah. Point well uh, made. You know, I, I would go back to the um I would go back to the question about a small response rate. Actually, it's pretty good. Um, so uh, when we got the state responses, um, we got 47 responses. So 84% response rate was pretty would be pretty good in my. Yeah, I think you're right. That's kind of so you know we had um, that, we had the that one that system. left. Go ahead, Pam. Pam, do we still have you? Yep, I just couldn't hear Carl. I didn't want to speak over him. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Pam. Okay, I, then I think I think maybe the one that you're that the whoever is responding to this may be questioning is the state representation in phase three interviews. That one I'd be less certain about, but the purpose there was simply to try to get a flavor. Um, for for some of the questions we were asking about of, of the then hotspot state so that one couldn't be representative uh that was simply just trying to get a flavor of things so yeah. the, the larger state survey not too bad i think but um not too shabby but the state representation gosh you know you'd love to have more of those and maybe maybe when there's other monies we could go back and ask about things there but that that certainly would be the one where it was just a sampling of information that we could get at the time mm -hmm. We've had several comments roll in and just in the past few minutes about courts being online. A lot of people saying that they um, they did have access to the courts, um, even in rural areas uh, online that could hold hearings. So um, it seems I like, wonder if, you know. if APS thinks that I wonder if those there's respondents because, of course, I can't see them I, because, you know, I on the other side of my life, I do a lot of work on guardianship and um, powers of attorney abuse, et cetera. And I wonder if the folks who are responding would see that this might continue past um, past the COVID period, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, the analogy would be. Oh, Pam, we lost you for a second. I think it went on. Sorry. That's okay. I, th I think, well, I. I, I Has that been a positive experience or a negative one? And do you Pam, I think your audio is going your audio is going in and out just a little bit for us, so we're having trouble hearing what you were saying. Okay. Um, let um, me, oh, go ahead. We can hear you now. Why don't you summarize it for me if you heard what I said? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't catch a lot yeah. of it. We didn't catch Did a you? lot of it. No. Okay. Really do you go, okay. So, so is that has. Has APS seen that as a positive that the, the 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 courts have gone to telephonic hearings? Because in some studies, I thought that was, uh, or has mm -hmm. that been a problem? Yeah, and we caught all that. Thank you. Yeah. So if anyone has any responses to that, or your feelings about whether it's been a positive thing or not, that courts have gone online. Um, here's one other question that rolled in just a second ago. Uh, comment and a question: The technical infrastructure, hardware, and software to support working remotely has been an impediment to providing consistent services. Has this been an issue across the country? Let me read that again. The technical infrastructure, hardware, and software to support working remotely has been an impediment to providing consistent service. Has this been an issue across the country? And the answer I would say, subjectively, anecdotally based, um, is yes, but it's highly variable. Um, there, there were some APS programs that were already supporting remote work or had made investments in technology to make their staff more mobile, and they were able to respond very quickly. Um, there were other APS programs that had not made such investments, um, and they were not as able to respond as quickly and then you had a whole bunch of APS programs that were somewhere in the middle on that so it really just varies a lot from state to state and in some states from county to county 
And I believe just to add a little bit to that, we've heard this, this is anecdotal, it's not part of the report. Some states have decided to permanently go to, um, to remote work for their employees as a result of, of having success with it. At least a couple of programs have. Um, a couple of people noted that they thought it was positive that the courts were allowing hearings over the internet. Several people said they thought it was very positive, um, but one person noted, you know, some clients don't have internet access in certain areas, uh, depending on how far out they lived, which could certainly be an issue in more rural areas for sure. I think that we, have, I think we surely have seen um, one of the problems, as, as I guess you guys know, I, I live in an area that would be considered quite rural. And even with people who certainly would have the means to have access to the internet, the cables, not, the, the, the lines are not laid. So we really, you know, begin to see that, that uh, the rural access problem becomes pretty important when we can be happy about having telehealth, but we can't be happy about not having access at all to get it. Mm -hmm. And a few other comments have rolled in recently that kind of um, reflect what Carl said a minute ago. Some people say, you know, the remote work has been good. And some people um, have really found it very challenging, especially if they don't have the right technology, which you all mentioned in your presentation earlier. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, we're coming up on the hour, uh, which is when we are planned to end this webinar. If you have any last minute questions, now would be a time to get them in. Oh, looks like we lost the screen a little bit. Oh, thanks, Leslie. Um, if we could go to the next slide, I believe, Carl, you had some some final thoughts you wanted to, to reference. So, you know, from my perspective of having worked in an APS program, um, th there is absolutely nothing more important in the world than listening to local APS um, staff. And, and this quote uh, from one of our interviews, I thought, kind of summarized um, what I thought was really important about uh, the findings from this particular study. And they said, just one last thing that I wrote down that my staff talked about, so this was a supervisor. And it's that they know they're often the only one that can protect and care for some of our most abused and neglected elders. And without them, my staff going out there, I mean, it's the only thing that stands between them and harm. And that's not a minor thing. And my staff takes that very seriously. And I love my staff for it. I have mad respect for them and how much they care about our endangered adults. So I just wanted to mention that because I thought it was important that they mentioned it to me. And so you will recall our first key takeaway was this study affirmed yet again the vital role that APS plays in local communities. And to me, this, this quote perfectly captures the essence of that idea. Thank you, Carl, I agree. I think that's a great quote. Um, if we could move to the next slide. Just so everyone is aware, you can access the full report, which includes a lot of the charts and graphs that we looked at today in some, um, of course, additional detail on the APS TARC website. Um, there's the link right there, apstarc.acl.gov forward slash COVID in capital letters. Um, and you can look at that report along with some other um, interesting pieces we found along the way about how APS programs are continuing to run. In, in these very challenging times. Um, so, and again, you can download the full report right now in the handout section. You can also download the slides from today in your handout section. This webinar will be posted online as well as the slides from today within a few weeks. Um, and if we go to the very last slide, um, just to let people know if you want to contact us, again, there's our website and our email address, support at APSTARC.net. If you'd like to reach out to us about anything, whether it's related to COVID or not, if you want to share your thoughts about what you heard today, and if you just have any um, you know, challenges in your program, we will do whatever we can to help you with that. That's why we're here. So thanks so much for our speakers today, Pam Teaster and Carl Urban, for enlightening us on this report. It was very interesting stuff. Thanks to all of our attendees today for showing up and listening to um, this webinar and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.